Recording in progress. There we go. Um, so in the first mission, we were talking about how how um, how beautiful it is for a person who studies Torah, how much God appreciates it. He, the whole world was created for people to be involved in Torah, and therefore when people are involved in Torah, so then they're called a reya, they're called a, a friend of God's, they're called an ov, a beloved one. They become beloved to God, beloved to people. They, they make God happy. And it just kept going on and on and on and on. And it actually took us a long time to get through that Mishnah because each, each phrase of that Mishnah, which talked about, um, you know, talked about the advantage that accrues to a person that is engaged in Torah, every single piece of that Mishnah was just a whole world. It was just a, it was a, stunning, a stunning thing. Then, great contrast to this Mishnah. So this Mishnah says, Amar Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, Bechol yom vayom, every single day, Baskol yotzeis mehar chorev. A baskol, whatever a baskol is, we'll decide that later. It is, um, but just translated, it means a heavenly voice. So a heavenly voice emanates from har chorev, from Mount Chorev, Mount Chorev is another name for Har Sinai. There are five names for Har Sinai. This is one of those names of Mount Sinai. It, it, it's going to figure very prominently why it's called Har Chorev. The word Chorev from the word Chorban means the mountain of devastation or destruction. Mount Sinai is not a mountain of destruction. It's the mountain that built us up as a people. So why would that even be a name that's given to Har Chorev, why is that a name that's given to Mount Sinai that we call it Har Chorev? Okay, so be that as it may, every single day, a voice emanates from Har Chorev, and it's Mach Rezes, and it publicizes, and it announces, the Omeris, and it says, Oy Lahem Labrios, woe is it to creations, me Elbona Shal Torah, from all humanity that was created, woe is to them for the degradation of Torah. Shekol misha eno osik b'Torah, because when a person is not engaged in Torah, nikra nozof, he's called a rebuked person. Shenamar, as it says, nezem zav ba'af chazir, that it's like a beautiful ring in the nose and the snout of a pig. Isha yofa, or like a beautiful woman, v'sorest ham, but missing any kind of substance. The Omer, and it says, luchos masa elokim hema, that the luchos, the commandments, were the tablets, were an act of God, v'amichtov michtov Elohim, and the writing was a divine writing, who chorus ala luchos, it was engraved on the tablets. Al tikre chorus, don't read the verse as if it uses the word Chorus, don't punctualize it that way, but rather take the same letters and punctualize it Chorus, that it's not Chorus engraved, but rather it's something that is Chorus, something that is free. She'en is like freedom. She'en l'cha ben Chorim, because there is nobody free alamisha osik betorah, betal Torah, like somebody who is learning Torah. That's the person who is real, who knows real liberty, real freedom. V'chol misha osik betorah, and anybody who is involved in Torah, Harezet misale that's considered elevated. Shenemar umimatana nachliel umanachliel bamos in the um, traveling of the Jewish people. So it says that we went from a place called Matana to a place called Nachliel, and from the place called Nachliel we went to a place of bamos. A uh, bamos. The word bamos is not just the name of a place, but it also means a high place. So the context that the mission is understanding that pasuk, it's saying from the place where we got the gift, i.e., Mount Sinai, we went to Nachliel, the portion of God, and from the portion of God, Nachal Nachal El, right from the portion of God, we then went to bamos. We then became elevated. The last half of the mission saves it a little bit, you know. So at least we, we can, you know, something a little positive. But the first half of the mission. After, after finishing that previous Mishnah, which, again, remember, was just so so beautiful and so up, and now the, the Mishnah of Yeshua ben Levi says that every single day this voice comes out and indicts the world and says to the world that you're degrading the Torah. By not living by the Torah, you're degrading it. And, and, it, and it, takes, you know, it takes offense at that, and it cries. And that the Shekhinah, the Divine Presence, is crying because of the Elbona, because of that degradation to the Torah. 
This is a little bit harsher than the previous one. So the first thing we have to ask is, what exactly is a baskol? What does it mean, a heavenly voice? And, you know, is it a, is it a navu? Is it a prophecy? Is it a ruach HaKodesh? Is it um, divine inspiration? You also have to wonder who hears it. So, so there's, um, there's 10 of us here. Anybody here ever hear this? Okay, so we're a small slice of the population. I, I, I suggest let's go out and poll a million Jews. And let's see if anybody will say, oh, yeah, 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 I hear that voice every single day. No, nobody hears it. If nobody hears it, is it really there? If a tree falls in the forest, is it, uh, you know, did it really fall? Right? And, and there's nobody there to hear it, to, to, to hear it hit the ground. Did it really fall? Notice if God is speaking to us every day, but nobody hears it, is God really speaking to us? Is the voice really coming from the mountain? Notice this is beautiful poetry. It's beautiful poetry. It's great. A voice emanates from Sinai every single day. It's like, great. You know, it sounds like some preacher really smacking the, the heck out of his people. Like, but what is it? Is it real? Is there such a thing really that a voice comes every single day? Okay, my third problem. Why don't we call it Mount Sinai? What it's called in the Torah. What we know it as. We know it as Har Sinai. By the way, the word Sinai is the same as the word Sulam, which is the ladder, a ladder. Remember, in a few weeks' time, we're going to learn about Yaakov's dream. When Yaakov falls asleep, what does he see? He sees a Sulam. He sees a, a ladder, which is planted in the ground, and it is Mutza, Mutza of um, Arza, and it goes up to the, to the heavens. And one of the explanations that our rabbis give, that that is, it's the Torah, that when a person starts on the ground, that he's, you know, if he's, he starts down here, but if he climbs up the rungs of the ladder, i.e., he embraces the Torah, so then he reaches Hashemaima. He reaches up to the heavens. Beautiful. Okay, that's why Sinai and Sulam are the same thing. Why are we calling it Harchorev? What was wrong with the, with the name Sinai? The name Sinai is, is profound. When we think of Sinai, when we think of Mount Sinai, it's a very profound thought and it's a very profound connection. Why wouldn't, why, why wouldn't we just leave it at that? What is, what is this Har Chorev? Okay, my next problem is that why is it a voice that's coming from there? Because Sinai is actually Mount Sinai. I know there's a little shock. You might have heard of me before. But Mount Sinai is relatively insignificant in our, in our practical Jewish lives. In other words, we don't look for Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai no longer has any real Kedusha. It no, no longer has any real sanctity. Because Mount Sinai, excuse me, was the place that the Torah was given to the Jewish people. But it wasn't the place of the living Torah. It wasn't where Torah was transmitted on a regular basis to the Jewish people. That was in the tabernacle. In the Mishkan, there was a thing called the, the Oel Moi, the Tent of Meeting, in the, in the desert, and that's where God spoke with Moshe, and, and the Torah flourished there. And then, when we finally came into the land of Israel, so then when we built Jerusalem, when we built the Beis HaMikdash, so then there was a chamber in the, to the, when you come into the temple the, 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 by, near the altar, to the right, which was called the Chamber of Hewn Stone, the Lishkas HaGazas, and that's where the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court, sat, and that's where Torah emanated. When we take the Torah out from the Ark, we don't say, Ki mi Sinai teitzei Torah, Ki mi Sinai, now it would fit, you know, in, in the words, it's fine, but Ki mi Sinai teitzei Torah, but we don't say that, we say, Ki mi Tzion teitzei Torah, from Zion shall go forth Torah, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, well, is that where it came from? It came from Sinai. Yes, it came from Sinai, but that's not where it continued to emanate. And to become a living Torah, that's not the place of where that happened. Where that happened was in the temple, and ultimately, where, you know, in the tabernacle, and ultimately where it happened was in the temple. And that's why we say, Kimi Tzion Tetzei Torah, because it was from Zion that Torah, that Torah emanated, and the Torah shaped and became formed, and then, and then became a, a centerpiece of the Jewish people. If that's the case, why are we saying that a heavenly voice comes every day to decry the, um, the, the, the um, lack of honor that it's being given by the world? Why doesn't it come from Jerusalem? My next problem, why is it coming to everybody? The nations of the world weren't given the Torah. Nations of the world weren't obligated in the Torah. Remember there was a controversy a, a couple of years ago, many years ago, 
about a, in a courthouse, I think it was in Tennessee or somewhere, where they had the Ten Commandments and they wanted to remove the Ten Commandments. I was all for removing the Ten Commandments because it has nothing to do with the nations of the world. It was in a Gaisha neighborhood. Yeah, in other words, it had nothing to do, had nothing to do with them. The Ten Commandments don't belong to the world. When, when, we, you know, when they say, we keep the Ten Commandments, my response is, give it back. Yeah, don't keep it, give it back, because it's not yours. It's mine. The Ten Commandments weren't, weren't given to the world. It's not a universal law. The Seven Commandments is a universal law. The Seven Noahide Commandments. Six of them which were commanded to Adam. One of them which was commanded to Noah. And then it became known as the Noahide Code. That belongs to the whole world. That every non-Jew is obligated to keep. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But every non-Jew is obligated to keep it. But not the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are mine. So why would God... What's this El Bona Shal Torah? Why would this voice be emanating every single day in order to be able to, 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 to remind them that they are degrading the Torah by not living with it? They don't have an obligation to live with it. Not only do they not have an obligation to live with it, after time, the Talmud says that the nations of the world are going to come to God and say to God, we have, an, we have a complaint because you never gave us the Torah. And they're going to, they're going to ask for, um, for you know, why weren't we given the Torah? And God's going to say, because you never could have had the Torah. You never could have kept the Torah. And he's going to prove it to them by giving them a mitzvah kala, a light, easy mitzvah called the mitzvah of sukkah. And he's going to put everybody in sukkahs, Jews, non-Jews, and then he's going to turn the sun on to its brightest. Right? He's going to flip up the dial and turn it on to, his, to its brightest. And then because it's so painful to be in the sun, you're actually allowed to leave the sukkah. A metzta'ir, a person who's in pain, is allowed to leave the sukkah. So everybody's going to leave the sukkah. Jews, non-Jews. Only difference is that the non-Jews, they kick the sukkah on the way out. And as soon as they kick the sukkah, they're so upset that they can't sit inside the sukkah, they're frustrated they kick the sukkah. So God points at them and says, that's why you can't, you can't have Torah. That's why I never gave you the Torah. Because the truth is, the reason that they were kicking it is because they were disappointed that they couldn't keep the mitzvah of sukkah. See, it's not about you. It's about God. The very same God that said to you, go sit inside that sukkah, is the very same God that said to you, now I want you to leave the sukkah. Because it's not a mitzvah anymore. Because now sitting in the sukkah is so uncomfortable, so unbearable, that I want you, I'm commanding you to leave the sukkah. So the same way you're being mikayim, you're fulfilling a mitzvah on walking into the sukkah, you're actually doing the same thing by walking out of the sukkah. Because you're serving God, not yourself. Nations of the world weren't serving God. The nations of the world were serving themselves. And that's why when they walked out of the sukkah, they kicked the sukkah in frustration. Because it was about them and their observance. It wasn't about God and, and building a relationship with God and doing what God wants, being an over Hashem. And therefore, they could never have kept the Torah. God proves it to them that they didn't have what it takes. To keep the Torah means to go against your will, which again, I'll talk about in a few minutes. But it means to go against your nature. We've spoken about it many, many, many times. And it's, it's really a critical idea. It's, it's this week's Pasha. When Avram Avinu was called to go up to the mountain and to slaughter his child. Do you ever wonder, you know, there's a lot of difficult things that God could have given him to do to show that he was the ultimate faith. But he was asking him to do something which was diametrically opposed to everything that he lived for. Because he lived for his children, and he lived for life. In other words, to, to be able to infuse life into other people. And here God was saying to him, take away that child's life. That's the exact opposite. Ab Avram was a person of chesed, a person of kindness. And you ask him to do the absolute epitome of something that wasn't kind, of the, of the opposite of kindness, the polar opposite of kindness. Because what God was trying to prove to Avram we want to say proof that Avram should know that what is the most important part of being a Jew? The ability to be able to go against your nature when necessary. Every one of us is born with nature. 613 commandments do not speak to our natures. Some of them do. Some of the mitzvahs in the Torah speak to our nature. You know, there are some people that love music. Love music. I have met people in my life, and I, and I know, Neil, you'll find this hard to believe, but, but I have met people that are mamish, not moved by music. They're not moved by music. And it's hard to imagine that a soul can't be stirred by some piece of music, but they are not moved by music. Now, in truth, one of these people that I'm thinking of is moved by rock music. But like I said, they're not moved by music. 
they're, in other words, their choice of music is not a is not a soulful kind of choice. So people screaming and yelling and throwing guitars around, you know, what they call punk rock or whatever they call it, right? So, so that's what they're moved by. But they're not moved by music. It's hard to imagine, but people have that kind of nature. We all have very different natures. There are things that speak to us and things that don't. There are mitzvahs that, that fit so much into our whole lives, our whole existence. And there are other mitzvahs that it's like scratching your nails on a blackboard. You know, it's, it's, it's against, it goes against the grain. But we do them, but they're not natural to us. It's not natural for us to do this kind of thing. That's what the, really, the, that's what the Torah is. The Torah is to bring out of us the, the, our, our real nature, to be able to take our nature and to subdue our nature in order to be able to serve Hashem. The nations of the world didn't have that capacity to be able to do that. And that's what, that's what God was trying to prove. He gave them this mitzvah to show they didn't have the ability to go against their nature. They could do things that were within their nature, things that they resonated with, but things that went against that grain that they didn't have the capability to do. That's, that's what we do. Well, if that's the case, why is God holding us and the nations of the world to the same standard? Why is he, that voice, emanating and speaking to both us and them? Okay, uh, that we are considered, the, the Mishnah says, that if a person does not keep the Torah, so it's not, it doesn't say it doesn't keep the Torah, actually. It doesn't say it doesn't do mitzvahs. It says that a person is, is, is um, not osek the Torah. Osek is a different word. La asok, we make this with the bracha every single morning in Birchas Torah and the blessings on the Torah. Baruch Ato Hashem Elokeinu Melech Olam, Asher Kiddushanu B'Mitzvah Sevetzivano. You sanctified us and given us your commandments, not to learn Torah, not to to keep mitzvahs, but la asok b'Divrei Torah to be fully engaged in the words of Torah. Halavai. I should have the opportunity, and I do a, a, a tremendous amount of Torah teaching and a tremendous amount of Torah learning, but I promise you that it's not every minute of the day. Halavai, I should be zolcha to, to live to that bracha that says, you know, that, that I'm learning lasok b'divir Torah, lil mod b'divir Torah, like to, to, to be constantly learning in Torah. That's not the bracha. The bracha is to be osek petora. Osek petora means that everything you do is in a Torah way. So you're sitting in front of a computer and you're doing your work on the computer. You're doing that in a Torah way. You're living, you're speaking, you're talking to people, you're communicating with them. Everything you're doing, you're doing is in a Torah way. That's the bracha that we make every morning or the bracha on the mitzvah of, of Torah learning. We don't make it on the learning itself. We make it on the lasok b'divay Torah. So here in the Mishnah, it says that a person who is not osek b'Torah so that person is called a nazuf. That person is called a, a, a rebuked person. Why is that? That if a person is not, is not osik betorah, that they're considered a rebuked person or a person who's in, in like cherem, a person who's cut off. Okay. One last thing. The word cherus. The end of the Mishnah was, is that the Torah is not charus, it's not something that is engraved on the stone, but rather it's something that is charus, that it makes us free. Now, I'll, I'll use the sign on Auschwitz, just to, just to translate a word. Right? What does it say on in the, in the Auschwitz, in the front of Auschwitz? Arbeit macht frei. Right? Work makes one free. Frei means free, Free of, of really free of, of any kind of any kind of obligations. There was it's a perversion, but but really when we say that a person how do we call a non religious person here in Israel? Right? Or or let's just say not even in Israel, but like in, in Yiddish, when we talk about we talk about a person who's not religious, we say they're fry. Right? The person's either from or fry. But fry really means not, not religious, it means free. So when we talk about freedom, we don't usually associate freedom with religious people. We associate freedom with not religious people, right? Let's just put two people side by side. Take a religious person, not religious person. Religious person, where can you eat? Oh, only in these places. Where can you eat? Turn to the non-religious person, wherever I want. Okay, turn to the religious person. Um, how many days a week can you drive in your car? Oh, I can only do that six days. And you, Mr. Not Religious? Oh, I, I can do it seven days, right? Um, what, what do you have to do every morning, Mr. Religious? Oh, I got to wake up. I got to wash my hands. I got to make brachas. I got I to daven. And Mr. Not Religious, what do you do? Whatever I want. So now you tell me. You know, this is not rocket science. Yeah, you tell me which one of them is free and which one of them is not. 
So why would we call Ein Ben Chayrin Al Mishayis Betera that the freest person is a person who's learning Torah? Not really. The person who's got the the greatest boundaries around them. That's a person who's learning Torah. A person who's living Torah is a person with boundaries. A person who every you know when a person wants to convert to Judaism. So what do we tell them? We tell them the mitzvahs kalos and the mitzvahs chamuras. We tell them the lighter mitzvahs. We tell them the more serious mitzvahs. What's lighter? What's more serious? Is you know that's a, it's a whole discussion. But we tell them we tell them everything. Now, why do you want to freak them out? Why do you want to tell them everything? Because you want them to understand. And we tell them even to the extent that when you put your shoes on in the morning, there's a way to put your shoes on. The right shoe goes on before the left shoe. And then how you tie your shoes, there's halacha about how you tie your shoes. This everything you do is guided by halacha. Because we want to impress on them this concept that we are of the Hashem. And Evan Hashem is not free. We're, we're, we're a servant of God's. Now, it's not a bad way. There's no negative context to it. But at the end of the day, don't call me free. I'm not free. I, I can't just decide that I'm going to eat, uh, you know, I'm going to eat treif. I can't just decide. I mean, I could. I have the physical capability to, but I can't really do that. So I'm not free. I'm, I've got tremendous amounts of rules. So what does this mean? That the Torah is charus, meaning is freedom. The word is freedom. The word is not chiseled. The word is freedom. Okay. So let's, let's now begin to explain the Mishnah. And, and I'm hoping I can I can finish this today, but let's let's begin to to explain the Mishnah. Let's take a look first at Har Chorev because I think that the 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 secret to understanding this Mishnah lies in why we call Mount Sinai Har Chorev. The Talmud asked the question in Tractate Shabbos, page eighty nine b. The Talmud says, "Vilama Nikra Har Chorev." Why is it called the Mount of Destruction? Sheyarda churva luumas ha'olam alav. That a churva, a, a destruction, a tragedy, a difficulty happened to the nations of the world because of it. What does that mean? You all know, and I say you all know because we've spoken about it many, many times, that when God wanted to give the Torah to the world, He went around to every nation and He asked every nation of the world if they would take the Torah. And Cutting to the chase, what he was asking every nation was to go against their nature. He goes to Ishmael, and he says to Ishmael, will you take the Torah? Ishmael says, what does it say in the Torah? And God says, it says that you can't steal. And Ishmael says, no, I'm sorry, but we are steal. We're thieves. It's, we can't take the Torah. So we ask on that message, and it goes to every nation and their, and, and their Achilles heel, and that's what God tells them is in the Torah. He doesn't tell the Asavites that you know, don't steal is in the Torah. He tells them don't kill is in the Torah. And he doesn't tell another nation don't commit adultery is in the Torah. Don't steal or don't um, kill is in the Torah. He tells them don't commit adultery. He gets every nation. He tells them exactly what they don't want to hear. That's what he says. Well, God sort of, he sort of made it that it was impossible for the nation to take it. Because if I know that you've got a softness for something, or you've got a weakness, and then I tell you, you know, I, I play on that weakness, I tell you, oh, that's what it says, I'm guaranteeing that you're not going to want to come. Right? Let's say I want you to come to my house. Well, I don't really want you to come to my house, but I'm, I, I need to invite you. But I don't really want you to come. So I know that you hate dogs. So what I'm going to say to you is, um, oh, please, really, we'd love you to come to the house. And don't worry, my dog won't be so insulted. You know, we'll, we'll put him outside or, you know, maybe we'll send him to the vet. Whatever, we'll do something. With him. You know, and, and you're going to say, oh, I don't really want... No, thank you very much. You know, I, I don't think I can make it. Right? Because I'm... And, and, and I'm thinking inside, Phew, Baruch Hashem, it worked. Right? So, so in other words, if I tell you what you're, what, what you're afraid of, so then you're not going to do it so why would God have told the nations of the world that that's what it says in the Torah when he was kidding Mamish their weakness? But it goes even further because the truth is they shouldn't have had such a weakness for it. Because remember the seven Noachide laws that I told you? So in the seven Noachide laws is don't kill, don't steal, right? It's, it's in there. So they were already commanded. Long before Mount Sinai when God came to them and said, will you take the Torah? They were commanded not to kill and not to steal. So why did they say no? Because com- killing and stealing, as far as the Torah is concerned, is a lifestyle. What God gave to the nations of the world when he gave them the seven Noahide laws was when it says don't kill, what does it mean? Don't kill. And when it says don't steal, what does it mean? Don't steal. But when it says to me don't kill, it also means don't embarrass. Don't kill somebody's excitement, enthusiasm, joy. 
Don't kill somebody's life. Don't kill somebody's somebody's impression that they have given to other people, that other people have of them. Don't destroy that impression. When it says don't steal, it doesn't just mean don't put your hand in somebody else's pocket and take their money, but it means don't steal their trust of you. Don't steal their sleep. That's what it means, don't steal. Well, if that's the case, so then what the nations of the world were saying no to was they weren't saying no to the rule. They didn't have a problem with the rule. The rule they were given already. Don't kill, don't steal. What they were saying is, is that we can't accept the lifestyle because the lifestyle that is the ad- addition to just not killing, it's the whole lifestyle of not killing. Well, I'm sorry, but that's something that, that we're not capable of doing because that would require us to go against our nature. That's why God gave them the very first, the, the mitzvah that he told them was written in the Torah was their Achilles heel. He told them the one that they had the most difficulty with because he wanted them to know that the Torah, the requirement of the Torah, what the Torah does for us is it changes our nature and that it requires us to be able to accept that we are that that, that that we have a nature that needs to be changed. Whenever I speak about this, I give a muscle. A king comes to a, uh, to his country and he wants to put up a new palace. And he goes to the first city in his country and he says, I want to put up a palace. And they send him back a letter. And they say to him, Dear king, we have done a environmental study and we say that we have f- found based on our projections that the noise level is going to go up to such an unbearable unbearable um, level that there is going to be an increase in traffic, there is going to be um, an increase in crime, we're going to have to spend more money on a police force we're not going to be able to do this, thank you very much but we don't want your palace. So he sends to the other country that's inside of his kingdom and they send him back the same thing and he goes every country like this and he goes finally to one small little dwarf, one small tiny little un- developed little town a little place and he sends them sends them a letter and they send back and they say we have done an environmental study and we see this can have an incredible impact on us and we see that it's going to bring in more noise more pollution that we're going to have to increase our police force and therefore we would like to know when you're starting construction you know there's they understood that it was going to it was going to demand of them a great change but they were open to the change they wanted that change and that's the Jewish people. When we said Nasev and Ishmael, we will do and we will listen. We were open to the change. And that's what that's what the, the nations of the world didn't realize. That to take Torah, to receive Torah, means to make a change. Not accepting the Torah, by them saying no, they let go of something that was so precious. See, they had a place in the Torah. I don't necessarily have time now to develop this fully, but they had a place in the Torah. Every one of the nations, the 70 nations of the world, were supposed to be, I often use this term, Gladys Knight and the Pips, that they were supposed to be our Pips. They were our backup singers. They all had something to contribute. They had they had um, characters. They had midos. They had things that they brought to the plate which God wanted to be developed and to be and to be then a part of the Jewish people and a part of the world. But through the Jewish people and through the Torah, the nations, every nation of the world, because you have to ask yourself the question, why did God go around to every nation and offer them the Torah? The Jews already said, you know, the Jews were, were willing. He took them out of Egypt to give them the Torah. Like, the thing was sort of done. You know, it would be as if I made plans with you and uh, and then I decided that you know maybe it'd be a little more lucrative for me. Uh, you know I can I, I can have a you know some some better perk that will come out of going with somebody else. And then I, I go and ask them, would you like to go bowling? You know, and and I had already made a date with you. And then as I call you up and I say, you know what, I'm not going to be able to make it. That's 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 shabby. That's bad news. Right, but that's what God. That seems like what God was doing. No, 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 no. God wasn't going to take the Torah away from the Jewish people. He went to every nation of the world to plug them into their place, to where they belonged within the Torah. Now, Esav had already given up his job. He tried him again, but Esav had given up his job when he gave up the firstborn ship to Jacob, two weeks from now is Pasha, right? So next week's Pasha, excuse me. So when he when he uh, three weeks, two weeks from now, when he gave that up. So then he already gave up his job. But the 70 nations, the other nations of the world, God wanted to staple them into the Torah. But they all said no. By saying no, they let go of something that was so precious. They let go of the very thing that could have made them into stellar human beings. In the very thing that could have taken a regular person 
and turned an irregular person into something magnificent. Because that's what the Torah does. It does it both for the Jews and for the non-Jews. By adhering to the Torah, by adhering to the seven Noahide laws, by us adhering to the, to the 613 commandments, it's not just that we are obedient people. But every mitzvah that we are engaged in, every mitzvah that we are involved in, changes us as a human being. And therefore, since it, it changes us as a human being, then we said no to something that really could have helped us. Can you imagine, I want to give you $5 million, no strings attached, and the U.S. government has told you they won't charge you taxes. And you say no. No? Look what you gave up. Even if they even if they charge you taxes, so they charge you fifty percent taxes, you still made two and a half million dollars. What are you saying no for? Don't understand. You no, know, you don't. You don't. Whatever. You don't want to. You don't want to move your life. Okay, you're a fool. You've given up something that could have changed your life. Well, the Torah, Allah has v'kama v'kama, the Torah, how much more so, that God wanted to give both the nations of the world and the Jewish people something amazing, and when we drop it when we don't observe it, when we let it go, so then that is a churban, that is a destruction. Because that, that is taking the world and the purpose of the world and denying the world its purpose. But why is it considered, why is the focus on the churban? Why is the focus on the destruction? If I had to choose between last week's Mishnah and this week's Mishnah, wouldn't I have much rather heard Torah gives you this and Torah gives you that and it's sweet and it's delicious and it's wonderful? Yeah, because it's not just about what it gives you because it's not that if you don't have Torah then you just don't have those things. It's that when you don't have Torah it actually is harmful. Not having those things, not having all those incredible blessings that are in the first Mishnah doesn't just mean that there are additions to your life that don't exist, but the fact that there aren't those additions means that there are things that are missing, which means that by definition, there is an emptiness. There's stuff that's, that's missing from you if you don't have that. And that's, the, that's, the, that's why it's called Chorva. Because look, as much as I like to call it Sinai, and, and we do call it Sinai, and it's a ladder up, but you have to come to terms with the fact that without it, it creates a hole in life. It creates a hole in your soul. It's nothing that we need to beat you with all the time. It's nothing that we need to walk around with and say, I, I'm living through such a churban. You don't, that's not, that's, not, that's not Judaism. That's not what we do. That's not the way we live it. But you have to know it. You have to know the reality is that if you don't have a plus, it's not just that you don't have a plus. You all, you have a minus. And that's a, that's a hard thing to realize. You know, a lot of times when you have an event and you decide not to go to the event, so you justify it by saying, okay, it's, just, it's like, it would be fun, but if I can't go, I can't go. But you don't think about Look at that event, it could be that I can connect with a couple of people. It might be good for my business, it might be good for my friendships, it might be good for my for my own soul, for my own feelings. You know, I sometimes get a little depressed knowing that I, I, I have these people. Maybe in a conversation I'll find out that there's a person that can that can help me, or maybe I'll find out that I can help another person. So what we've done in our minds is we've just said, well, there won't be any plus. In other words, okay, I'm willing to forego the plus. I, I won't have fun. I'm, uh, tonight, I'll just stay home. I'm okay with that. But we don't realize that not having that plus, it's not just not having the plus. You have to calculate also. I'm not saying that you have to go to everything, but I'm just saying that you have to calculate what's the minus because there's always a minus when you're not getting a plus. Okay. <sighs> You know, if you think about medicine, that, w you know, certain medicines, th certain therapies, that if you were de to deny those therapies, it's not just that you're not taking that medicine, but you're actually helping yourself self-destruct. You're helping yourself, you're, you're, you're helping that disease, that sickness, whatever it is that you have, you're helping that um, to continue to grow. And that's why it's called chorev that this voice comes out from our chorev every single day. 
to let us know that the fact that you don't have a plus, it's a minus, that you're missing something, and that, that the Torah is crying for its people, Jews and non-Jews. Because without that level of morality in the world, the world is missing something, and there is a churban, there is a, there is a terrible destruction and desecration that's going on in the world. It becomes worse when you know that you have it. You know, in the Torah, God says, Behold, I place before you the blessings and the curses. A few chapters later, it says, Behold, I place before you life and death. So our rabbis ask, wait a second. The first time the choices were presented, they were called choices of blessing and choices of curse. When you keep the Torah, your life is blessed. When you don't keep the Torah, your life is cursed. Why the second time is it called of life and of death? Curse is not as bad as death. What happened in between those two presentations that now we're calling it life and death, something that without it, it could kill you, as opposed to just curse your life, just you know, turn it sour a little bit. So our rabbis say, if you look carefully, the mitzvah of tshuva, the mitzvah of repentance, sits in between those two passages in the Torah. And the mitzvah of tshuva says that you are living your life one way, but you have the strength, ability, gift to be able to take your life and turn it around. Before you were given that gift to turn your life around, the fact is, Living this way is a blessing. Living this way is a curse. But now that you've been given that gift, not utilizing that gift is not merely just a curse. Now it's death. Now it's final. Now it's a ruination of life. It's a much more serious thing. When I didn't give you a chance, when the cell door was closed and you couldn't get out, everybody understood why you couldn't get out. But now that I opened the cell door for you, and you still don't go out? That's now a tragedy. That's the El Bona Shel Torah. The hugeness of Sinai makes it a Har Chorev, makes it a mountain that is an indictment and that can destroy us. Not because it's some vicious thing with thick teeth, but it's because of the, of the positive nature, because of the beauty of Torah, of what it can do for us, not engaging in it, and it's not studying it. It's la'asok. It's being engaged in its lifestyle, being engaged in its morality, being engaged in its ethics. That is what turns a life void of that. That's what it turns it into a korban. turns it into a terrible emptiness. What's a baskol? Baskol is a, a heavenly voice. But that heavenly voice is not going into the ears of a person. That heavenly voice is going into the heart of a person. And that's why I can ask 12 million Jews and nobody will say they've heard it. Not with their ears, but they can hear it with their hearts. When we call the Torah freedom, freedom doesn't mean when we use that word fry, you're free. When we use that word free, what we mean is you're free of any kind of obligation. That's not what Judaism is. It's not what Torah is. Torah is mole. It's filled with obligation. But within those obligations, within those boundaries, that's, what, that's where freedom exists. Because when I have no rules and I have no boundaries and I could do anything, then I really end up doing nothing. It's very difficult to centralize myself. It's very difficult to pull myself together and to become something because I have no obligations to become something. I have no real guidance to become something. But when I have Torah and I have mitzvahs and I have lifestyle and I have morals and I have ethics, so then that gives me the ability to be able to take what I believe in and to be able to shape it into something that it's not just a feeling inside of me, but it becomes the entire definition of who I am and how I live my life. And that's called ultimate freedom. When a person has the ability to do something but doesn't, that person is enslaved to their desires, they're enslaved to their society, enslaved to things around. 
I always tell the story of two Jews that were sitting in a cell in, in the Soviet Union. And the one's name was Yosef Mendelovich. And Yosef Mendelovich had no nothing in the cell. And his next door neighbor, not cellmate, but next door neighbor, Anatoly Sharansky. And the two of them made preparations going close to Pesach, realizing that they had no Haggadah. They tried to piece together things of the Haggadah that they remembered hearing as children. They took little raisins that they they might have found inside of their food, put it in water so that they could have something that they could call wine. They would take little scrapes and scraps of things of any greenery that they would find and that they would use that for moror. And Pesach night, they sat inside of solitary cells singing the songs of Pesach together, drinking their raisin water, and saying, Avodim ayinu lefar mitzrayim v'yotzienu Hashem lokeinu mishom. Hashtavdin, this year we're slaves, but next year we're free. These were the two freest human beings in the entire world. Because there's nothing that could hold them down. And that's what the Torah does for us. The Torah allows us to soar. Even when we don't always have physical freedom, but we always have spiritual freedom. And even in the Holocaust, when things were when we had nothing and things were taken away from us, the stories of spiritual freedom, of what, what people did and were capable of doing, is incredible. And it's not just about, you know, having chauffeurs and, and lighting Hanukkah lights, but how people were kind and benevolent to each other, how people loved each other, they reached out to each other. Torah is considered freedom. It's not choros, it's not chiseled into us, but it's cheros. It's the very thing that brings us freedom. And when we have that freedom, our hearts feel that freedom. And our hearts hear that a Kaddish Baruch Hu who only wants that from us. And that he cries and laments over those who can't achieve that freedom. Those who have the capability, the ability, those that are living in countries that are open where they could grab anything they wanted and don't. That's the sound that comes out. And whose heart does that touch? It touches the hearts of those that are free. Of those that have, that have embraced God and His Torah. And that you can hear every single day. When you look out at the world and you see its level of non-observance and you see its level of disconnection, you can hear that sound always. And that's what the mission is telling us. The mission starts off a little tough and it tells us, you know, you can hear this sound every day. And the mission says, but you have to understand that what it's begging people is to become free. And we have the ability to be able to come free. The more we attach ourselves to the Torah, the freer we become. Okay. That's tonight's Mishnah. My thoughts. I love it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Next week, Yitz Hashem, same bad time, same bad channel. Okay. Thank you. Thank Everybody you. should have a wonderful week. Thanks, Thank Rabbi. You, Rabbi. Have a great week. Thanks wonderful so night, wonderful week. Is it one more time? A list of your classes I have this Zoom room in the world Okay, so if you if you put in the ch- just in the chat, just uh, type me in your email address, I'll send you that. Thank you so much. Go okay, ahead. my pleasure. My pleasure. Have a wonderful day. Okay, Thank let you. me Have let me. Way. Okay, I'm just going to take this now off recording.